Okay, so it's a real pleasure to be here. I am in a, in a unique situation, at least for me, because that's the first time an organizer asks me to talk about a specific paper. And so Jean-Philippe asked me to talk about a paper that is 17 years old, um, which is fun because I had to read it again and remember what it said. Uh, but it's, 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 uh, so then I decided to do it as a real mathematician with, with this. And uh, I thought, you know, at the end of the day, everybody would be tired. I can go slow and, uh, and explain this. All right, so the, this, the story that, that is, so this paper is called, it's a, a, a paper of 2005 with uh, Stanislas Bo uh, Morchanov and uh, Bogachev. And it's called Sum, Sums of Random Exponentials. It's an obscure title. But uh, um, of course, I, this, this paper was used a lot after that by, by, in, in my own work. But, uh, but Jean-Philippe told me, talk about this one. So let's go. So my hero you know, is, n sorry for that, but was not Anderson. But I will come back to Anderson. Of course, for me, the, the hero is Paul Lévy which uh, is a different word. So we'll come back to extremely simple things of, uh, again, it's late in the day, about uh, elementary probabilities. So what we know is everybody knows. So let's start with the simplest thing. Oh, maybe I should start here. Let's start with the simplest thing of uh, probability. Let's go back to de Moivre or Laplace or whatever. If I have ID random variables, there are two things that we like to study. The first is the sum or the empirical mean. Okay. And, and so of course we know that as soon as the, the XIs have a first moment, then we have the law of large number. Converge to the mean. As soon as, if I, if I assume that I have a first moment. And of course, I have the central limit theorem as soon as I have a second moment. So that's what I've taught uh, a million times. OK, so that's really elementary. And then, of course, and that's not Levy. That's way before that. But then, of course, you have the, uh, the question what happens. So the most important thing to say about that is, of course, that this is a universal result. We all know that's the first universal result. That's a CLT. That is, you don't need anything about the distribution of the, except the existence of a moment to have this uh, limiting law. Uh, then, of course, uh, you have Levy came up with what's, ha what's happening when you don't have a second moment, right? And he found, of course, all that is old, uh, he found that you had universality classes, if you want, but which are tiny. The universality class here is huge, right? So what Levy found is that if you had the fact that the probability of the tail, let me assume that the xi's are positive here. So I just look at one tail. Otherwise, I have to look at the positive and negative tail. If this behaves like, uh, and this is a regularly varying function. If you don't like regularly varying function, think of L as a constant. Otherwise, it's like a log, a square root log, or whatever. If you have this with the alpha is, let's say, between 0 and 2, so if you have uh, power laws like this, then you know what happens. So if alpha is between 1 and 2, I won't, I mean, of course, specific things happen at, at 1 and 2, then you know that the law of large number is still valid, of course, because, you, because the first moment is finite. But the, sec the CLT is no longer valid. The CLT is now replaced by the fact that the uh, this thing, instead of being of the order 1 over root n, is 1 over n over alpha. And this converges in distribution to what is called a stable law. 
constant parameter alpha. That's Levy contribution. And if alpha is less than one, then the law of large number now is no longer valid. So here what this tells you, the law of large number is valid, but the fluctuations are no longer Gaussian. And they are larger, right? And if alpha is less than one, then the law of large number is not valid, and you just have that this, uh, uh, This converges in distribution to a, another, a stable low with this index alpha. So the fluctuations are stable here. And this is an interesting region, of course. So alpha equal one is the special, specific case we've just seen before. But this is interesting because suddenly now this is linked to the other uh, elementary things in probability, which is extreme value, right? Extreme value theory is, you want to look at, and this is not Levy, of course, is the other thing you want to study on a random variable is, let's say, the maximum. Right, so this has also been understood fully, and you know that there are only three limit theorems, three classes. Right, the Gumbel, the Frechet, and the Weibo, right? Which, you, if you write them properly, you can put in one. But you have three type of classes: one which corresponds to things with short tails, another one which corresponds which thing was bounded above, another one which corresponds to heavy tails. Okay, and okay, so the distribution of this thing, the limit laws for that are well understood, right? But now you could ask yourself, when is it that uh, the, the maximum, the largest of those terms, plays a role in the sum, right? So you know that, again, this is very elementary probability. You know that when you are in the CLT case, the, every term is completely negligible with respect to the sum. Nobody contributes. So the maximum divided by the sum goes to zero, right? Here is kind of the same, but this, this heavy tail, in this case between one and two, play a role in the fluctuation here. So the maximum does not play a role really in this, but in the fluctuation. And of course here, so this is an interesting case. When alpha is less than one, then indeed the maximum is of the same order than the sum, right? It's a finite fraction. Okay, this converges in distribution to something. Right? So this tells you the maximum, the largest term is that like the sum of everybody else. And in fact, you can do a little more. If you, let's order, let's do order statistics. I call x1 the maximum, let's say, and x2 the second maximum, etc. I order all my numbers, right? And now I can look, again, I assume all of them to be non-negative just to simplify, and then I look at this point. The largest one divided by the sum, the second largest one divided by the sum, right, this n tuple now, so you look at the fraction done by the largest term, the second largest term, the third largest term, this thing of course, uh, you know, is something which will converge. So if you look at this thing, this converges in distribution to something which is called the Poisson Dirichlet process, whose parameter alpha. Okay, so the first atom, the largest, the, the contribution of the largest term, the second largest term, the third largest term, all that converges to something which is well understood. Okay, and Levy uh, played a role in this thing. I won't tell you why you looked at that, but that's a, that's a fact. So that's basic stuff about uh, IID random variables. And the story here can be ignored in some sense, because who cares about heavy tails? Of course we do, but, uh, right? So, <laughs> right? So now here, I'm saying this, so th this paper was about showing that uh, this behavior that I just described, so of course I could say, 
So here I have this convergence to a stable law. If you looked at it dynamically all along, all, by changing your n, you would have convergence to what is called a stable process, a stable subordinator. And from there, you can build many things. But anyway, so that was in this case. So now here is a different, a very, very simple thing. Let's take, again, my xi. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have erased that. We are still iid. But let's assume that they are uh, light tail, right? So for instance, anything like, something like this. And they say rho larger. Okay, so for instance, Gaussian, or if you do this roughly. All right, so fast state of things. So in this context, with these guys, you cannot get any of these interesting things where the maximum is interesting. So now you, you look at the following, you change a little bit your problem, and you look at this. So here I, cho I chose one function, which is exponential. I could choose any other. That is, let's say, increasing. But it depends on a parameter, OK? So sum of random exponentials. OK, the really interesting thing would be to also put here a weight. I could do that. In fact, it's important to do it. But let's forget that for the moment. And now I'm asking, what is the behavior of this thing when both n and t are large? Right, you know, purely academic mathematical question. All right. So what happens? I'm sure you can guess. If t is fixed, then this thing, notice that all these exponential t x i have all the finite moments you want, right? Because of this condition here, right? So expectation of exponential t x i is finite for every t. Right, so I have no problem. Of course, for this, right, this should be easy. So if t is fixed, right, we are back to this situation before. And of course, I should have the law of large number and the CLT. Right, I have first and second moment. But now, so when t is small, I should have this. But now if t is very large, depending on n, you can see that at some point, the maximum will play a role. Right? If t is extremely large, the largest of those terms will dominate. So there should be a transition in between. Right? And so of course, that's what we find. So we find that the transition is like this. There are three or four regimes. Your regime one, where t is small enough, right? So it's t smaller than a certain, uh, or let, OK, I can choose t as a variable or n. n is smaller than a certain n one of t, right? Then I will have, and of course, I could describe all those scales. You would have the law of large number n CLT. A larger. OK? If n is really large or t is really small, I would have the situation we had before. Then you have a second region where you would have uh, n larger, uh, n, OK, n smaller than n1 of t, but larger than n2 of t. Then you would have the law of large number, but no CLT. And stable fluctuations, as we had before, with an alpha between 1 and 2. And then, but understand, here you have stable fluctuations, even though these distributions have no heavy tail at all. Right? No heavy tail and still stable fluctuations. And third, if you have an n which is smaller than this n2 of t, then you would have no, no law of large number, and you would have a stable limit for this with alpha between 
0 and 1. And in this case, you would have, again, the same result over there. That is, if you look at, you order your thing, and I call them x1, divided by the sum. This goes to um, Poisson Dirichlet process. Same thing. And if you look at Sn of t, I didn't say that, you have a stable limit for Sn of t, and as a process, it converges to a stable subordinator. So alpha is some function of log. Yeah, it, it's alpha is, I can tell you what it is. It's, it's what deter, okay, I should tell you what it is. Um, let me, let me say that. You compute it just by computing the, uh, okay, it's, let me not go there, but it's hidden in, the, in this regime. You just have to compute the, the Laplace transform of your things over there, the moment generating function, and this tells you what these regimes are, okay? So, interesting. Of course, you know this, at least those of you who do spin glasses, because of course, if you take at least you know that in a simple case. If you take the case where the xi's are, are Gaussian, you, and then you recognize, and if you take t to be beta times square root n, this is the random energy model, right? And so, and the random energy, but of course, so here this which, okay, I organized everything in terms of n, I could have done it in terms of t, so, of course, you have other regimes. Then you have a fourth regime where I could, where, in fact, this thing goes to one, which is like a Poisson Dirichlet process with alpha equals zero, where essentially the maximum is the same thing as the whole sum, right? Okay, so, okay, so that's a curiosity, and it's, in, it's uh, but why did we do that? Why did we ask this uh, question? It was not about the, the REM, even though, but I will of course come back to the REM and its dynamics and to spin glasses later, but it was because of a, something which has to do with Anderson. So the story, and it's a real story, the story began by a fight between Molchanov and myself. If anybody knows Molchanov here, He's a very good mathematician, but he has really strong opinions. So, hmm? Unlike yours. Uh, not like me, yeah. <laughs> so we did fight, we did fight. <laughs> so I gave a talk on a result related to parabolic Anderson. You all know what parabolic Anderson problem is. We all know Anderson localization, but you can, instead of looking at the spectrum, you could look at the parabolic equation defined by a random potential. And, and, uh, and then I explain something about the uh, annealed and quenched asymptotics of these dynamics. And I had the bad idea, so I will come back to that. And I had the bad idea to say uh, that this point of view that the annealed uh, or average dynamics result, which was a very celebrated result in this case, it was a result going back to Donsker and Vardan in the 70s was, uh, it was then a hard result, was kind of a, what you could do. And then when much later, 20 something years later, Alain Snitman and his collaborators managed to do the quenched asymptotics, that was a, a fantastic thing because that was the real thing you wanted. And then, so my view was the anneal is what you do when you can only do that, and quench is what you do when you are, you know, you've spent 25 more years of uh, renormalization. And then Molchanov told me, no, 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 no. In some, some problems, the quench thing means nothing. It's the anneal one that is important. Interesting, right? So that, then we fought, and then, we, then we, we finally agreed through this theorem. So let me explain. So here's the model I was talking about. So take your, let's say you're on ZD. You, you, could, you could put on RD and you take a Brownian motion, but I will take a random walk, standard random walk. on RD and on ZD, and at each site, right, you have a variable, I don't know, say, eta x, 
is 0 or 1, with probability p of being 1. Right, so you have a Bernoulli disorder. And every site that is 1 is a killer. Right? So the simplest thing, so you have a cloud of killers. And when the random walk hits a killer, it's dead. Right? That's it. Of course, I could have a soft killer that doesn't kill at every time. But let's do it strongly. So this corresponds to a parabolic Anderson. You have a random potential here, which is 0 or negative infinity. Right? And so you're, and then you, 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 you let your random walk evolve, and you want to understand what was the important thing was the probability of survival up to time t. So what Donsker and Varadan did in the 70s, using their famous work on the Venus sausage and so on, was to prove that the probability, if you start from zero, of survival, uh, after, uh, at, at, at time t behaved like exponential minus certain constant uh, t to the d over d plus 2. OK, so that's, but their result was annealed, right? So that was this and expectation, if you want. Because here you have two disorders. You, you have the disorder, you have the randomness of your random walk. But of course, you have the randomness of the landscape, right? So when you average, this is what they got. Yeah, yeah, of course. And on, on the dimension, too. All right, so that's a very important, very serious result, which dates back to the 70s. Then you have the result by Snitman, and I think the collaborator in the, in the last paper was Antal and others, which, which gave the almost sure, the quench result. Was like exponential minus another constant, depending also on P and D. And it was T over log T to the D over 2, if I'm not mistaken. So much, much less, right? The, to survive, so why, why was that such a big difference? The idea is simple. In order to survive, you want your random walk to go to a clearing, a region with less killers, a place without people to kill you. If you ha are in the annealed case, then you can use the randomness of the medium to create, to hope that the medium will create an empty place around the place where you start. Right? You can just be born well, right? You're born in a place where you don't have many killers, and you stay there. That's the strategy to survive. Be a coward if you can count on the randomness. But if you cannot count, if it's quenched, then you cannot do that. So the only way, the probability to survive, and what I'm saying here is literally hundreds of pages of work. The, the, prob the probability to survive is to go very fast, ballistically, until you go, you find a region which is empty of killers, right? Which, which would be far and not that big. This is much less probable. Most of the people trying this, this strategy will die, but a few will reach the right region and survive up to time t. So that's why it's so much less probable. All right? So the debate was this, this is nice because it's an yield, and, but it's, you know, the real result is this one. OK? OK. So I had worked, so to tell the, the history, I had worked on seriously applied questions about nuclear waste. And, and I, had, I was interested by that. The killer here was a good guy in the nuclear waste thing. It was the thing that would capture your nuclear waste that you were trying to store. Whereas uh, Mochanov had worked on chemical kinetics, and for him, that was the truth. So what was the difference between the two? So let me explain now the picture we came up with. And this is this transition that I'm just erasing here. So here, in, just introduce a new, uh, one more level 
of randomness. Start from a box instead, so I'm in ZD here, and you, you take a box of size L. And now you start your a population, each one particle at each site, or equivalently, you start at random inside this box, right? So what you see, so, you, you, so what you look at is the probability of survival, right? Now is one over size of the box of size L, sum over all these guys in the box, of the probability that starting at X, survival until uh, at time t, right? So you look. At, so this means you look at the. You have introduced one more thing, which is the extent of your initial condition, right? So now you can see that if L is small, like L is one, you are necessarily in the. But the, the disorder now is completely quenched, right? The disorder is fixed. So if L is, is one, you are, of course you should get the quenching estimate, the Snitman estimate, right? You should get this one, because you start from one point. But you can imagine that if L is very large, depending on T, then you may get the annealed one. And that's what happened. So now, and then, of course, you will have a transition between them. And now you have three regimes, like I've just told you with this elementary thing. One where the, the box is large enough, you have the law of large number and the CLT for the, this probability of survival. When the box is smaller but still large, you have the law of large number but not CLT, stable fluctuation. And then when the box is smaller, you have this Poisson Dirichlet, which means what? Which means that the total population, among the whole population, the, the, where will you find, what are the extreme values here? That's, that will be the survivability of those clearings. So what is the strategy? If you have a box, and then, so inside it, you have nice region where you want to be. Right? Where you don't have many killers. So initially, of course, you will have, uh, uh, essentially, your population will be in this whole collection of things. And then you have law of large numbers, central limit theorem, and so on. And gradually, when you give more time, so more chance to be killed, a few of these guys will dominate. And at the end, you will have only, you will have a Poisson Dirichlet process. And at the end, you will have only one place to be born. And if you wait even longer, then all these guys will, will die, and the place to be will be very far, and that will be the Snitman answer, okay? So, but now this is, okay, I'm saying you have the same type of transition, but how is that related to what I just said before? Where do we have a sum of IID or an exponential of IID or an invariable? Of course we do. And of course for that, you just do a spectral expansion of this. Right? This is a semi-group. This is a property that told the survival is larger than T. And the only important thing, so if you expand spectrally, right, the only important thing that you will have will be, so you will have eigenvalues, right? What counts here are the extreme eigenvalue, the large ones, the one that allow, which are, of course, here everything is bounded by zero because everything is decaying. Those eigenvalues are the one, the dominant eigenvalues will be the one that tell you these guys survive. And of course, their, their eigenfunctions, you will have to inner product them with the indicator function of this big box. And so what you really need to understand is the eigenvalues of this Anderson model. And you need to understand the extreme eigenvalues. And this is hard. This is where Alain worked hard. But once you do that, Molchanov and I, and Ramirez, I'm sorry, in this thing, Alejandro Ramirez from Chile, prove this full transition. Except that, of course, I'm, I love Levy, so I love to say that uh, stable distributions are everywhere, but not completely. So here, here it's a little more delicate. You still have this transition with CLT, law of large number only, 
And then the fluctuations are not exactly stable. They are infinitely divisible. They are a variant of stable, close to stable. All right? Of course, the proof of that is much less elementary than the, the paper that uh, uh, Jean-Philippe wanted me to talk about. But OK, so we did that with, with this uh, killing. Now you can ask yourself, I do the same now, but with a general parabolic Anderson model. At every site, I either kill, I can kill softly, not kill hard like this, or I have branching, right? So I can have a positive potential, right? So we did that with the same crowd, Ramirez and Molchanov. The last paper on that was, I don't know, six years ago, I said, I don't know. And you have the same picture. Exactly the same thing. You have a full transition between the annealed and quenched asymptotics in a quench regime. So this tells you the annealed asymptotics, again, as somebody who had worked on spin glasses, annealed was like what you can do when you cannot do anything else. But in fact, in this, much out of convinced me here, we, that, that in fact, annealed can be true, can be the true thing if your initial, here in your initial condition, spans enough of your spectrum, right? Which is what, what we're talking about here. Now, I still have some time, right? OK. So this, this was this, uh, this thing about parabolic Anderson. I've mentioned Anderson. So now then you can realize uh, maybe this works for many other things. Because anneal and quench, you have that in many places. Right? So this is what we did. So, the, uh, so let's, for instance, take another problem, which is take supercritical percolation. Right? So let's go to a harder problem than these. So you take supercritical percolation. All right, so now let me, ask, let me write this. We are on ZD. So of course, now I always want problems of dynamics in random environment, right? So let's take ZD, and I take supercritical percolation. So let's say I, I uh, so I have an infinite groups. I have an infinite cluster, and I look at the random walk on it. Right? So first thing to ask is, is that Brownian? Right? And the answer is yes. That, that is known, seriously, mathematically understood. So this, this random walk converges to a Brownian motion. Right? So that this is a question of homogenization, which is not completely trivial but which is understood. So this goes to Brown in motion. All right, so let's add one thing. Add a drift. So you have your random walk on this percolation cluster. OK, that's the problem with doing this with a chalk. I cannot show you a percolation cluster instead of doing that. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and now you add a drift. So let's say you're in Z2. You had a drift, let's say, in the direction of the first axis, whatever, right? So you, uh, I can write an explicit model of having a drift. That's not the point. You add a drift. Let me call the drift uh, beta, OK? So the strength of the drift. So when, I, when beta is 0, I have no drift. I have a Brownian motion. Now if I add a drift, should converge to the, the limiting thing should have a velocity, right? So if I call, I don't know, uh, yn my random walk, then if I look at the distance from yn to 0, this should behave when n divided by n, this should have a velocity, which or let me call the drift lambda, right? So this is true. It has a velocity. The question is, uh, is this velocity positive, right? Let's say 
So, so interestingly, so of course before, so you see this, you say, oh, this is a hard problem. Let me study it first on a simpler case. That's what we, before going to ZD and a critical graph like this, a supercritical graph like this, you could take a supercritical tree, right? That's simpler, okay? So you could do the same on a supercritical tree, random tree, and see if your thing moves ballistically or not, right? That's what I'm saying here. That's what I'm asking. This problem is not easy. Okay, so think of it. Take a, take a, a supercritical tree, random tree, Galton-Watson tree, for instance, branching tree. Take the random walk, you would have the same thing. Is the velocity positive? What do you think? It depends, of course, on one very important thing first. It's whether you have leaves or not on your tree. That is, whether you have dead ends on your tree or not. Right? If you have, if every side on the tree has an offspring or is different, if you have no, then you have dead ends. You have your tree and you have places where the tree, so a tree, I don't know. You know, mathematicians draw a tree backwards. The root is up, right, always. I'm sure you, you do the same, maybe. So you have a tree like this, and then he, if here, you have something which is a dead end. If I push in this direction, you see, I, I, can, I can get stuck there, right? So it's not completely clear. So the answer is the following. First, if you have no tree, if you have no leaves, the problem seems to be simple. So you could imagine that this V of lambda increases with lambda, right? The stronger you push, the faster you go. So this is proved for lambda larger than, in our notation, 717 or something. But it's not proof for the whole regime. But now let's forget that. Imagine that you have a random tree with, which, with, with leaves. Then this V of lambda behaves like this. So it starts, let's say, this is the... Above one means that I'm pushing to the leaves, right? Otherwise it means I'm pushing to the root. It's supposed to do something like this. So the velocity increases first when you increase this, the, the, the action. Here, of course, you can imagine that the derivative of this, the derivative of the velocity, by, by the Einstein relation should be the variance of the Brownian motion on the, uh, on the thing without a drift, and it is. But then, so this, this whole thing is not completely proven. What we know is that it's positive in a region here, and we know that there is a value here above which it's zero, right? But if you try, you will see this. This is a very paradoxical region where the stronger you push, the slower your random walk goes, right? But you have all, the, all, all it takes to understand it from what I just said. So let me explain how this first abstract nonsense theorem tells you this. So if, so think you have, you're on your random tree, you're pushing, you spend some time on the backbone of the tree, and some time on the leaves, on these traps, right? Now, if you spend, uh, you know, if, you're, if you push too hard, the time you spend in the traps is heavy tail. There's a power law in the large traps. So now you're summing, so, and of course, how do you see that? You just apply what I said. You, do, you could do also a spectral analysis exactly like before. And you will see precisely the same thing. If you push too hard, the time will, you spend in the trap will be too heavy tail. And here, this, you are in a region where this velocity will be zero. Right? Whereas in this region here, this, is, this region should be, nobody proved that it was, you had a one unimodal like this, but it should be. 
This region should be the region where you have the CLT and the law of large number. This one is the one where you have the law of large number and no CLT, the stable fluctuation. And this one is the one where you have uh, the uh, stable distribution. So why that? It's because most of the time you, sp you, you spend is now in this part is in the, in the traps. And when you're in the traps, you don't move microscopically. You have to come back to the, the backbone to move. And indeed, here, you can prove a stable, on this part, you can prove the stable character of the, of the, the, the random walk. So this was done on trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you can do the same thing on, on the super, supercritical percolation cluster. Much harder, the result is the same, right? So when, if you push too hard, you get, again, a, uh, a slow motion. It's not st always stable. And now this is where the mathematician is happy. It depends on the arithmetic properties of your slope, of your drift, right? So th there are some other crazy fluctuations, but it's essentially the same picture. All right, so I talked about all this. Of course, I didn't talk about the spin glasses, but just give me one minute for that. Now, if you take the REM, as obviously the, REM, the random energy model for the static is in the realm of the initial thing. But now you could take dynamics for the REM. Right? So now you have a motion on the hypercube with random rates. So we did it first with uh, Anton Bovier and Veronique Guerrard a long time ago using what we've called the Bouchot trap model dynamics. So Jean-Philippe had introduced that for the complete graph. We did it on the uh, rigorously on the hypercube, and you have the same picture. But now what you have to analyze are the eigenvalues of the dynamics of your random, uh, of this uh, random energy model. And you have the same thing. Where are the top eigenvalues? They are in the very deep space, uh, points where the, the, where the Gibbs measure is high, and you have exactly the same thing. You have the Poisson Dirichlet. You have the convergence to the stable process and the arc sine law. From there, you can understand the aging of the REM in those very long time scale. At this point in time, I didn't know that physicists would call them uh, activated dynamics because people were not looking at these time scales then, but now they are. And interestingly, this this. So this works exactly the same. You can understand the aging in exponential time scales for the REM, at least in this model where we had this simple Bouchot dynamics. Since then, Veronique Guerrard has done it for the usual Glauber type dynamics, which is much more pain. And the same thing works for much harder model of spin glasses. So we've done with Yirgi Cherny and Anton Bovier, if you take the P-spin model, easing, not spherical, much, much harder in the glass phase. Not, I'm not, so if you take this, then similarly, you look at the, the Bouchot dynamics for it, you find exactly the same universal phenomenon. The time, if you look at the whole time, T, in fact, most of your time you spend in some traps that you have to describe, of course, for the P-spin model. And the time you spend, the aging is the same. And this arc sine law or whatever, Poisson Dirichlet process is the same. If you look at the whole, the point on your trajectory where you spend the maximum time, it's a finite fraction of the total time which satisfies this Poisson. And the second one is this Poisson Dirichlet thing. So it's a totally trivial fact, going back to Paul Levy, that once you generalize it properly, percolates to the spin glass thing. Of course, in the spin glass thing, it's valid for the P-spin, it's valid in exponentially long time scales, but not long enough to, always, uh, to get to equilibrium when you are at, it, it's valid at every temperature, including in the bottom temperature that is below the Gardner transition, but there it's only for time scales which are not long enough so that you get to this full replica symmetric region. So it's essentially related to the one replica symmetry breaking region, which is uh, the glassy part, right? So this stupid picture works, including for this uh, problem, which is less, less trivial. 
And now I, I would be curious to know why Jean-Philippe wanted me to mention this thing, but he, he will tell me. Thank you, Jean. I, I think it's pretty obvious, right? This I is a know. very general thing. Yeah, it's a general it's a, thing. It's yes. a beautiful story, so I think that everybody might have enjoyed it. And also, in economics and finance, there's a lot of problems which are sums of exponentials. Oh, I so I think it's, it's really a beautiful framework.